Hi, Niels. Uh, hi to everyone. We are at the moment in Impact Hub in Stuttgart, uh, where today on the 10th, 23rd of September, the Chameleon Conference should take place. Unfortunately, we were not able to organize it, but nevertheless, we decided to produce some Chameleon Nuggets with some of our keynote speakers. So I'm very happy to introduce you today to Niels Flaging. Hi, Diana. Good to be here. Hi. It is very nice to have you here and that you could manage to come from Wiesbaden to Stuttgart and that we can offer our audience uh, some special nuggets. Yeah, I like the idea of nuggets, <laughs> golden, golden things. Okay, let's try to do something golden here. Yes. Golden, okay. Uh, so let us start uh, for the beginning. For many of us, 2020 has been a very challenging year and uh, it's been a real emotional roller coaster. And uh, from, from the mental side, uh, it is even a test for each one of us. So uh, we are trying to figure out what is the present state and how is going to be the future. And while we are thinking about all those things, I noticed that you have been very, very active and you published already three books in those half year, half years. Mm -hmm. which we have behind us. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I have some of them here yes, a, yes. as well. Yes. Uh, the first one was the self-structured design, uh, something about the beach and decentralized organization, which we will talk about a bit later. Then uh, you published, uh, it was a book you published with Silke Hermann, which is very important to say. She's also a co-curator of this con conference, which didn't take place. But unfortunately, she couldn't be here tonight. Uh, the second book has been uh, in each organization. There, there is a better is, company in every company. That's, that's, that's right. kind of the title of this book. Yes, Which It's in German, sadly. It's not in, in English, German, but. but in my opinion, it's a real masterpiece. and Which is uh, written with Ernst Weichselbaum. Mm -hmm. And just one day ago or two days ago, the Essays on Beta Volume 1 also were published. So for me, it would be very interesting to find out in the last six months, what was your motivation? What was the drive through all these times to come up with those books? When uh, the lockdown happened in Germany, um, where I live, um, of course, all my uh, most of my business dry, uh, dried up because I'm a public speaker. So I speak on events like Chameleon Conference and... Uh, Almost none of that has been taken place over the last uh, month. So uh, all of this dried up in March. And March was also the, the month when uh, this book, Cell Structure Design, uh, was coming out, was published. Uh, so we had this ready by the time. Uh, and um, of course, I th what I also do is organizational development and consulting in that arena. So helping organizations to transform just just as you do in Croatia and uh, in the Stutt Stuttgart region mostly. So the question was, okay, what do we do now? Now that um, many client events are canceled, um, many client workshops cannot take place during the lockdown, what should we do? And um, I thought for myself, okay, now is the time to, to run, to do the project, the product work, to develop new products and write new books. So one of the first things that uh, we did, Silke and I, we have our own small company, a startup that was only founded two years ago. And these, uh, the books are part of our business as well, in that we think that um, in, in organizational development and leadership, we need much more innovation, much more. We need smarter tools, smarter complexity tools, as we like to call them, or social technologies. And uh, that stuff wants to be developed. It must be, you know articulated and designed and presented and made available. So the first thing we did was designing new posters and learning boxes that are on our web, uh, website and our web shop and uh, to write books. So this book, um, it took me three months of the lockdown period uh, basically to, to write it for my colleague Ernst Weichselbaum from Austria. And then I went directly into writing this book. They look kind of similar, actually, right? Yes. Same same cover design. Because I'm, if you ask me, what are you doing during during Corona? Um, I'm doing less business, of course, as many people in our in our field. But then again, I have time to design our stuff as well. So I do a lot of graphic design and uh, getting the books printed as well. So it's it's uh, a lot of work in in designing nice learning materials, and I think that's a. Uh, something that has been missing from 
organizational development, the field of consulting, corporate services. I completely agree with this one because uh, it was a real refreshment uh, uh, on this book landscape in organizational development mm -hmm. as such. Uh, all those books, I don't know about the essays on beta, but mm -hmm. I suppose uh, this book is already also the, the same. The, um, the topic are decentralized organizations yes. or the pitch organization. Yes, and always. you are... Mm -hmm almost two decades in the business and promoting this idea yes. as the answer to complexity and to the dynamic markets. Yes. So what is in your opinion the most crucial precondition for such an organization? Yes, well, um, the precondition to, to uh, well, let's say, let's, let's call it organizational transformation to creating better, more peach-like organizations instead more of more pyramid-like organizations. I think the the foundation of it all is to really want it, uh, which sounds simple. And many people might think that they want stuff, but they, they do not. I think most organizations suffer from a lack of wanting, wanting to change, you know, creating the will, creating agreements internally that, yeah, we want to be more effective, we want to be less siloed, less functionally oriented, less centralized, have less steering, uh, less steering in the organization. You must really, really want those things. When I started with this kind of work 17 years ago, our main tag was beyond budgeting. Abolishing budgets is one of the piece, the, the cornerstones of getting towards more, to more de decentralization. Creating a cell structure and, and, and letting go of centralized command and control processes like budgeting, performance appraisal, fixed targets, bonus systems. And you must, well, first of all, you must really, really want that. That's the precondition. That's the only precondition there is. Somebody in the organization must really, really want that. I like to, com I like to compare it with, um, uh, with Game of Thrones. Uh, let's say this um, John character, Jon Snow, he really, really wants you know, to win. And sometimes you have to pick up your sword and fight for the right thing. So I, mean, I mean, not like killing people but, or, or dead people, you know, uh, like in Game of Thrones, but uh, you must really, really fight for the right thing to happen. And consultants cannot, they cannot, they can help you doing these things technically, but they cannot help you want it. Yes, I agree on that one. Yeah. It is very interesting to have at the Chameleon also the Game, game of Thrones and Jon Snow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> An organizational development. I like to talk about topics. movies and yeah. books and, and novels and, and, and series as well, TV series, yeah. <laughs> Great. Then we have something in common. But let's go back to the topic. We know that the decentralized organization is a cr crucial point to cope with complexity and yes. the dynamic markets. Yes. So... What is, in your opinion, why don't we have more decentralized organizations and more people who are really wanting it? Yes, I think the, the topic decentralization, the topic of decentralization is not well understood. When we say decentralization now, maybe many people think, aha, let's give more power to our business units or take power away from that and that supposedly is centralization and decentralization. In over the last 30, 40 years, that has been the game of centralizing, decentralizing. Uh, shift HR more to the corporate level or organize it down to the business units and that kind of stuff. Or marketing, you worked in marketing as well. I'm a marketer. I was a corporate controller. That can be more centralized, decentralized. That is not the kind of decentralization we are talking about here. Decentralization in, 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 in the context of beta or our conference here means um, uh, organizations have gotten used to centralized steering, you know, making up plans about the future and then controlling and steering the organization with processes like budgeting, forecasting, cost uh, allocations and so on, target setting, bonus systems. So we are used to this, we call it, usually call it top-down steering, but it's also a way of centralizing the organization. Managers steer the organization. Uh, the problem is that in complexity, markets start to steer an organization. And most organizations, corporations these days are suffering from the effects. Markets have taken on the power in the 1970s, 80s, 90s. And the steering now means that we have this constant conflict with clients and shareholders and, 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 and also um, people who provide services and, and products to us. So the steering has become a problem. Steering is not... Um, um, 
uh, a means towards more efficiency today. It is really like a toxic, a toxic tradition, so to say. A dead horse that we are still riding. Decentralization means giving power to teams in the periphery so that they can run the business and the headquarters. Most of the time they shut up. Yet most of the time they sit on their hands, as they say in Handelsbank, which is a beautiful way to describe the top burden of top managers in a decentralized, radically decentralized organization like Handelsbank and or Toyota or DM is that top managers have to sit on their hands most of the time, almost all the time. Uh, that's nice that you mentioned also Handelsbank and uh, DM because, mm -hmm. uh, as I understood from your books from early on, mm -hmm. is that they are already for decades decentralized. And if you look back, for example, now, um, did you notice, because I know that you are speaking to many people, that you are in contact with many organizations, um, did you notice through the last two decades some changes on the sea level or from the entrepreneurs? In which way? Yes. So when I started all of this 17 years ago, we're talking about beyond budgeting first, um, and then we rebaptized it into calling it beta or the beta codex. And at, when I started with that, people really laughed at me or they uh, kind of ridiculed me and the work I did. Uh, there were people shouting, Some, sometimes in, in, in Germany or in Brazil, or where I spoke, there were people in the last row shouting, this is communism, and it's, it, is not, it has nothing to do. I think in a way, today's corporations are communist, in that uh, shareholders or owners are disappropriated in a way. Uh, we see that in the corporate scandals that, that we can observe every day in the press, that uh, shareholders and owners are their patience is tested by top managers and their ineffectiveness you know the ineffectiveness of command and control organizations have become so big so so burdensome that uh, organizations are suffering a great deal from it decentralization in fact is taking the the insights from market economies into organizations a cell structure design as we like to call it or a decentralized cell structure or so where the periphery is in charge. It means being much more, uh, that organizations become much more market-driven because the, no, the external clients can steer peripheral teams, which then in terms steer the center of the organization. This, is the, this idea of a peach organization means the periphery or the fleshy part of the, uh, the peach is in charge. And it makes organizations more like market economies. It's a beautiful thing. Um. I am completely with you. That's a beautiful thing. Uh, the question is, do uh, the entrepreneurs and the sea level understand it as well? And this, yes, I think no. I think there is a lack of understanding. I think there is a lack of knowledge about this 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 model. Um, like, uh, in, uh, we are sitting in Germany here in Stuttgart, uh, the headquarters of uh, DM Dogerimark. They are not far away in Karlsruhe, maybe a hundred. 150 kilometers from here, very close, right? 90 kilometers, see. Yeah. And still, it's such a successful company in Germany, especially, but all over Europe, really. Um, and still, those companies, those uh, pioneers, as we like to call them, of this decentralized organizational model, they are often ridiculed or seen as exceptional. Ah, they have different people and that kind of stuff. It's nonsense. That's not true at all. Uh, the secret of a beta organization is to make a much better business, much create much more value with ordinary people, with just, just the same people, normal people. The secret is not of Toyota is not to have better engineers. I think uh, engineers in Germany are probably much better than Japanese engineers, honestly. However, if you organize them like crap, I mean, if you, if you put them together in silos and departments and so on and steer them to death, then there will not be the same output and value creation will suffer. You mentioned uh, a great thing again, <laughs> beta. Yes. And uh, you are also a co-founder of uh, the Beta Codex. Yes, it's a way of organizational thinking, uh, which is co uh, which is fit for complex markets mm -hmm. and fit for the human nature, mm -hmm. and it is based on twelve principles. Yes. So uh, one of the principles is about mastery. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a topic which is also in my private uh, uh, circles uh, very interesting. And sometimes we are discussing this topic even uh, for hours because uh, we are trying to, uh, to define what mastery really is. So 
In your opinion, what is mastery? This is the first question. Secondly, how to recognize mastery? And the third one, how can we help the young people who are coming in the organization to become masters? Uh, but why do you discuss this so intensely with your friends or colleagues? Because how, how uh, comes? maybe some of them see it some kind of differently. Oh, okay. Yes, there, there are different opinions uh, on it, what mastery really is. Ah, okay, okay. So maybe you share, then share with me what you think mastery is. I think it's, for. I mean, we are both, um, um, we learn business and economics. Mm -hmm. economics. And of course, for us, there is a serious problem for people like us, knowledge workers, as we are sometimes called, to make it beautiful, to beautify the problem. Uh, of course, we do not produce a, a thing, Usually, I mean, I also produce the book, books, but I don't print them. So uh, for us, we don't have the the pleasure that um, artisans or uh, people working on the field, you know, what they have is they have the pleasure to say that when the deed of the day, that when the day's deeds is done, that here's what we accomplished. Yeah, we collected these, but we we grabbed these potatoes off the ground, and we produced this product and that product. You know, uh, I produced a chair or a house. You know. Uh, we don't have that. So the problem is, for us, it's harder, for us knowledge workers, it's harder to determine our mastery, you know, because it doesn't show up. Not necessarily the result reflects your mastery. If you talk to an artisan, an artisan knows exactly what she or he knows to do, you know. I'm the best welder, 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 of the, uh, the world's best welder or whatever. I'm the best at laser cutting or whatever. Yeah. Um, for knowledge workers, that's, uh, it's tough, I think, and um, but nevertheless, organizations live from people's mastery. The, we currently have this digitalization hype that suggests that we just have to automatize, digitize everything, which is nonsense because we still, you know, the water we drink is still physical. Um, when we ha have some, some health problem, the solution is often, more often than not physical and not digital. You know, we need to eat, we need to go to places physically we have to have houses and clothes all those are physical we have lots of plenty of physical needs and um, the question of mastery shows up easily and when you produce something physical and it's harder for us to understand what mastery is in the in the realm of services yeah. however i think for example i know that i can design stuff i can design a book an entire book if I need to, or a magazine, or a newspaper, or a journal, or, or, or a poster, or a website. And it is important for each of us to know what we are really, really good at, what we can master. Organizations, beta organizations need mastery because only people with mastery are s capable of serving, solving complex problems by coming up with the right ideas. That is why mastery matters. Now, every organization is full of people and all these people have mastery. It's just that often this mastery doesn't show up or usually this mastery doesn't show up at all in the org chart. Yeah, unfortunately. That's a problem, <laughs> unfortunately. The, 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 I mean, that's if really and that's the problem with, uh, with functions like marketing, sales, controlling, uh, uh, even product development. Um, those are title, hor horrific titles that have nothing to do with the mastery. I agree. They are that, much yes. too abstract, you know. They are not. They are not specific. And usually, you don't work if, only if you work in a real team and when you rely on each other that you s start to figure out what the other person is very good at. I heard uh, from some very, very intelligent, uh, knowledgeable master people. Mm -hmm. Uh, that in the process also when you go into the direction to a cell structure design also through the open space beta that is always very interesting because uh, if you ask in the organization mostly people know who the masters are and that those people and are master not, not in, in terms uh, of hierarchy but no, mas no, no, ma people uh, with, with mastery yes, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. with, with yes. mastery there is every organization has a secret knowledge about the mastery that it it possesses um, and you find that in situations when, when, when you really suffer from, from a problem, let's say uh, Daimler is not far from here. Uh, Daimler was very famous, famous for its uh, mastery culture until, until the 1970s. So whenever they had a big problem in, in, in production or in product development, they would say, okay, who, who, can, who can solve this problem? And there's always one person who can solve the problem, but usually that doesn't show up in the org chart. So you have to ask around, 
who is this person who can solve the problem? And usually the answer, uh, answer is Andrea or Klaus or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's usually a person who's not in the org chart, who is not a boss, who often has no budget and no you know, import, formal importance or authority uh, whatsoever. But it's just the mastery, the most the important mastery. thing. That's why yeah. you need Klaus or Andrea in, in, this, in these uh, occasions, yes. exactly. And there's no way around it. because Just because you have a, a, an important position, that doesn't mean that you can solve complex problems when it's needed. There's one question just before the end. Uh, it is about uh, theory X and Y. Yes, uh, that's a great topic. I love it that is, topic. Yes, <laughs> and that's also the question why we have those quarrels in, in private circles uh, regarding the mastery. Um, when we ask people, mostly or also leaders in, in some companies or managers, um, How do they see their employees? They always say, yeah, yeah, theory why. They are all really motivated. Uh, they are also creative. They, are, uh, they can take the responsibility and so on. Mm -hmm. But if we look how they interact with them or how they communicate with them, yes. we always see that they go back in the pattern in a view of uh, theory X. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is in your opinion? How can we enable them to interact and communicate or to change or to be uh, aware that uh, the play is not um, sy synchronized, mm -hmm. that they are thinking one thing but doing actually completely yes. different. Yes, there is a great American expert on, on, let's say, systems theory, organizational development, Chris Argerus. And he, I think in the 1970s, he wrote about this problem that we have declared values, value, values that we declare as valid, that we so oh, we have these values and we tell everybody about it, but they are not really necessarily the values that apply in our behaviors. There is usually... We, don't, we all have that problem that the values we declare, often we do not, you know, really, they, they don't show up in our actions. There is a difference, a gap. Now, this gap, if it's so small, then it's not so problematic. But if the gap in an organization of declared values, you know, announced values, and the reality is too big, then an organization like that breeds a culture of hypocrisy. Or th even theft or fraud, naturally. Because, you know, if, if you, what you say is never what you, what you act upon, then you have a problem. So the, I think the, the, for, for, the, for the purpose of developing organizations, it doesn't matter what people talk about values. You can figure out the real values if you look at how do, how do pay systems look like? What, what are people, how are people paid? You find all the values there. How do people meet? How is information um, transmitted? How transparent are the facts and figures in the organization? It's there where the values show up. Because you can declare the value openness on your website for ages and not be open at all with the numbers and the facts. So you, you don't give people data or information to make bold, you know, good entrepreneurial decisions. Or you say, ah, people are, people are the center of our world or whatever. That's the... What, How is that cliche usually written on the website? People are our, our core asset. That kind of stuff? Our key resource. And then you see that, no, well, they are, they are incentivized and, and, and after, after they have been recruited, they are treated like infants or stones. So um, all these declarations of values, they are, they are dangerous. I, and also that's something that we, that we advocate not to, not to work out you know, values, nice value decorations, because that's a lot of BS, actually. So the real thing is to, to, to take a look at the actual processes and, and practices and patterns and take a look at what, what values speak out of that. And if that doesn't look good, you know, the values embedded in our PAVE systems, we should change it. Thank you. Uh, you had a lot of interviews. I see it all the time. Uh, in digital, in print, uh, radio interviews, whatever. Mm -hmm. What is the question you never get asked, but you would like to answer it? 
I think there are a lot of questions that I would like to be asked, but maybe when I started this work, I was in my th 30s at the beginning. I was 31 or so when I started doing this kind of stuff. So I was, I think I was perceived and I acted maybe a little bit like a young wild guy. I didn't take the drugs, never, but uh, I, I act a little bit like the contrary and the revolutionary. And now I'm almost 50. So I, and now the questions are changing. People say, yeah, I think that's the age, you know, the white hair. So I think some of the questions will come up only in 10 years when I'm 60 or when I, in 20 years when I'm 70. And I think I would like to be asked uh, things like uh, Niels, this open space beta thing, uh, cell structure design, all these topics, they are so great. Why do you think people are still doing change management? Why are people still organizing, you know? Or, or when do you think this will go away? You know, these old ways of organizing so and command control. When will it go away? Yes, these, these, and, and then I will try to ask with a lot of wisdom, uh, to answer that with a lot of wisdom. Uh, for the time being, I think we have hard work to do, you know. Um, we have to, we have, we all have to make an effort to uh, put command and control systems on the garbage heap of history. That's what we have to do. For the next 20 years, and then we can have the nice, beautiful, philosophic interviews. Thank you very much, Niels, for this conversation. Thank I'm you. very sorry that it's so short time because there are a lot of different topics I would like to discuss with you, but maybe next time. Mm -hmm. And for sure, when we will meet at the Chameleon Conference here in Stuttgart, when it will be when announced and possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Diana.